Hello, I'm Jay Smith, Senior Pastor at State Street United Methodist Church. I'm so pleased that you're joining us for this service of worship. If you do not have a church home, I want to invite you to join us in person each Sunday morning at 8.08 and 10 a.m. We're located at the corner of State and 11th Streets in Bowling Green. And you can also find us on our website at www.statestreetumc.org. And now may you be blessed by this service of worship. Good morning. One of the most beloved greetings in the church is grace and peace and your responses and also with you. Grace and peace for the Lord be with you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. You never know on a day like today who's going to come and who can't be with us. But I knew, as I look around, I knew you would be here. And exactly the folks that I thought would be here today are here. I'm glad you are here. If you're a guest visiting, my name is Jay Smith. I'm thankful that you've come to worship God. If you're a guest, just a couple of quick things. There are Get Connected cards on the pews all around you. We'd love to reconnect about the ministries of the church. If you'll just bring that card to me at the double doors or these, or at the back doors, these double doors, there'll be a member of our hospitality team after the service. They'll have a red badge on. They'd love to speak with you uh, and uh, receive any information you're comfortable sharing, and they have a gift for you. We'd love to share that as well after the service. So if you're a guest today, uh, welcome, and uh, please be aware of those things. Just to remind those of you that may, because of the weather this morning, normally come to 808, but you're here right now, just to remind you, next Sunday we won't have an 808 service. Next Sunday is the Christmas Cantata, Night of Miracles, uh, will be our music ministries, uh, worship leading next Sunday, 10 o'clock service only, so please be aware of that. Speaking of services, alerts you to the insert. If you're wondering what are the different services this year at State Street, what are the other mission opportunities remaining in this season, all of those are there for you on the insert this morning. Many of you are probably aware that Bill Franklin passed away, a member of our church family, very faithful to the early service, and Bill's arrangements are visitation today at J.C. Kirby on Lover's Lane 2 to 7, and then tomorrow visitation will be here 10 a.m. until noon, and the service is at noon here in the sanctuary. So I know you're thinking of Ruth and Heather, their daughter, so please continue to remember Bill Franklin's family. We're here this morning, all of us today, uh, for the same reason, and that's to worship God. I'm so very thankful you've come. Let us worship the Lord.
A reading from the book of Isaiah. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and peace. O come, O come, Emmanuel. I invite you to stand on this second Sunday of Advent and join in singing our opening hymn, number 203, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. standing and let us join our voices together with those through the ages and affirming our faith the Apostles Creed is printed in your bulletin would you join with me I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit 
born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. join me in the reading of the word. It's 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 through 31. In the Pew Bible, that's page number 1,128, and in the large print, 1,773. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Jesus Christ, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you turn in your red hymnal now? to number 211, number 211. And look now in the lower section of the right-hand page. These are called the O antiphons. O as in, O come, O come, Emmanuel. The antiphons for Advent and Christmas tide reference deep, rich Old Testament imagery from which we may draw greater understanding of the attributes of the Messiah. Through recitation, call and response, singing, and the repeated plea for the Messiah to come to us, we bear witness to our deep longing for Jesus Christ by invoking a series of his Old Testament names. Today we will focus on Antiphon 6, which employs the name Dayspring, an ancient word for daybreak or dawn. In Job 38.12, God reminds Job of how small, how not God, Job is. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days? and caused the day spring to know his place? But then in Luke 178, from Luke's infancy narrative, the word is employed also to remind us of God's gracious incarnation of Jesus. Through the tender mercy of our God, the day spring has visited us from on high. And so today, as I prepare to lead us in our morning prayer, will we first join in the responsive antiphon, antiphon 6, on the right-hand page at the bottom, join in reading and, uh, responsive reading of antiphon 6, and then the singing of the sixth verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. 
O day spring, brightness of the light eternal and sun of justice, come and enlighten those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. God of heaven and earth, you have ruled over your people like a caring shepherd and promised through the voices of your prophets to send a Messiah of humble origins to feed us and to keep us secure. Lead us now to be receptive to your care that we may be nourished by your kingdom come not only in eternity but here and now. We confess, O God, that we are inclined to seek our security and direction from leaders who seem high and mighty and to place our trust in things that appear to be big and powerful. And so remind us now of how powerfully you accomplish your work in and among us through humble agents in lowly places. Confound our expectations and astound us by your ways, coming to us from where we least expect and when we least expect and even when we are looking in all the wrong places. Teach us, God, during Advent and Christmas to see power in odd places like little Bethlehem a lowly manger, and a tiny vulnerable child whose name is God with us. May perpetual dawn shine the light of your love to us and through us to others, that your coming may be the beginning of the day that Christ is born in us, making us and making all things new. Hear our prayer, O Lord, for we pray it in the name of the baby, the same baby who grew to become Jesus the Christ and who taught his disciples when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. just want to bring a few things to your attention before we have our offering this morning. First, I would like to draw your attention to the rose on the altar to my right. That rose is placed there to celebrate the birth of Mason Terry. Mason was born this week to Laura and Mark Terry and the little brother of Caitlin Grayson and Jackson Terry and the grandson of Nick and Anita Lowe. And I know that you join me in celebrating that birth with them and um, praying for them through these next few days. I also want to remind you that if you took a prison angel or a, a senior gift from our trees outside of the office area, all those gifts are, need to be back here by Saturday, by Sunday. Um, on Sunday, you bring the wrapped prison angel gifts, but you do not wrap the senior gifts, and those can come back to the office sometime this week. 
And also this Friday afternoon, after school is out, around 3.30 or so, we're asking people to come and help us assemble all the food boxes that we will be delivering. So if you could assemble on Friday afternoon, we encourage families to bring your children and do that, but everyone is welcome to do that part. And then on Sunday morning, we are still in need of drivers that can deliver boxes to the families in our community. All of that information is also in your insert at the bottom part where it says some Christian Christmas mission opportunities. So if you don't remember those dates, just look down there. It's a very busy weekend coming up. And now I do invite our ushers to come forward as we give of God's tithes and our offerings. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Dear gracious, loving God, we are here this morning. We are awestruck at the wonderful things that you provide for us daily. Lord, for the blessings of our families and friends and the opportunities that we have to do warm and wonderful things for each other. And Lord, we just ask you to be with those that are not so fortunate. Help us with, our, with your tithes and our offerings to reach out to a world that is hurting, Lord, and is just troubled and doesn't have answers right now. Lord, help us to be the ones to provide some of those answers and to give them relief and just love, to show them your love in a powerful way and in small ways. We ask that you help us to go from this place and, and perform things for others that just show your love in just all kinds of ways. In your name we pray, amen. You know, all the children are joining for children's moments. Come on up here, guys. Okay, friends, I'm going to show you some pictures. 
and I want you to keep it to yourself, and then I'll, we'll share what it, you think it is in just a second, okay? So here's what we're going to do. All right, Nate, I want you to scoot that way, and I'm going to show this side one picture, and Gus, and I'll tell you what, Madison, you go over here with Nate, and I'm going to show you friends another picture. So we've got Team Owen and Team Jay Gardner. How about that? That'll work. Okay. So Owen, I'm going to show this to you and keep it to yourself. Don't say anything. Okay. Okay, friends, I'm going to count to three and you tell me what you saw. One, two, three. Wait a minute. I, I showed you guys the same picture. You guys said a rabbit or a bunny. You guys said what? I said a bird. You said a bird, a dove, or a duck? Hmm. And I showed you the same picture. <clears throat> Isn't it funny how sometimes we can look at something in two different ways? Isn't that interesting? And all we had to do was just turn it and look at it a different way. Isn't that fun? So if you look at it one way, you were right, it was a bunny. If you look at it another way. Is that a bunny? See it? Oh, there's the bunny. Ah, there's the bunny. Okay. And then we just have the duck. Isn't that interesting? So that's how God saw Bethlehem. And by that I mean he saw it different than everybody else. Right? You guys are gonna go upstairs in a second, so you're gonna miss the scripture that's coming up. So I'm gonna read you the kid version. And everybody else is going to get to hear it twice. That'll work out. That's okay. He says, But you, Bethlehem, are one of the smallest towns in Judah. But from you will come one who will rule Israel for me. He comes from very old times, from days long ago. Did you catch that? That God chose a small town. If you guys ever uh, watched or read Charlotte's Web, what, was, what do we know about Wilbur? Wilbur was really what? He was a what? He was a little pig. He was the, he was the run of the litter, right? He was the smallest one, but he went on and did big things, right? He became a big deal in that story, and that's kind of like what's happening here. God chose the small town to be the birthplace of Jesus. So, well, we thought it was, big, it was a big deal because we know it on the other side of what happened, but before then, it was pretty small, right? And he chose that. Okay? You know what I kind of think about that? I kind of think, and maybe I'm, and maybe I'm wrong. You think about this too. I kind of think maybe God chose a small place like that because you remember we talked about Jesus wasn't a king like everybody else? Like how we talked about kings a few weeks ago? I think he wanted him to be simple and, and down to earth and with the people. Don't you think? So maybe that's why. I don't know. Think about that. But we all know, we, last time we were upstairs talking about our hymn, we know that God has a what? Anybody remember? You say plan. God has a plan. There we go. We'll just plant that in you. <laughs> and today, friends, if you, everybody's invited upstairs again today because we're going to talk about another Christmas carol upstairs. We're going to learn that sometimes God's plan is surprising. Okay? And we're going to keep talking about that upstairs. So remember, friends... Don't take it for granted just because you're small that something big can't happen to you too. Okay? You guys pray with me? Okay, let's bow our heads. Dear God, thank you for the blessings that you give us. We're thankful that we're here today. We're thankful that you choose the small and the weak to sometimes be mighty. And we just pray you continue to watch over us. In your name I pray. Amen. Okay, friends, everybody's invited upstairs today. That's all good.
One of the things that most of us love very much during this time of year is the singing of Christmas carols. And this Advent season, we're looking at some of our beloved Christmas carols. We're looking at where these songs originated, and we're looking at, more importantly, the message uh, of these uh, beautiful carols. If you'll take your bulletin insert on the uh, other side of, of the, where the worship services and mission opportunities are listed, the words to this particular carol that we're looking at today, Reverend Phillips Brooks was a 19th century Episcopal clergyman and author, and in 1868 he wrote the words to O Little Town of Bethlehem, and we'll be referring to these words and actually be using them uh, a little later uh, in the service, so just to alert you to, to that. Over 700 years before the birth of our Savior, the prophet Micah spoke about the eventual birthplace of our Lord. Micah 5.2 is our scripture lesson for this message. For those of you who are able, would you please stand and honor the reading of God's holy word and the proclamation of the gospel. The prophet Micah declares, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from of ancient times. This is the word of God for the people of God. And thanks be to God. At nearly six feet six and weighing 300 pounds, Philip Brooks cast a long shadow. He was a native Bostonian. He was Harvard educated, the ninth generation of distinguished Puritan stock. He entered the Episcopal ministry and he pastored with great power in Philadelphia and in Boston. At the time, he was considered one of America's most gifted preachers. He would introduce, later in his ministry, he would introduce Christianity to Helen Keller. It is said that he's, his delivery came in lightning burst. He felt he had more to say than time in which to say it. A dilemma most preachers feel. That's all right. Can I get an amen from Gary? While at Philadelphia's Holy Trinity Church at the age of 30, Brooks visited the Holy Land. And it was on Christmas Eve in 1865 while he was traveling horseback from Jerusalem, about five miles from Bethlehem. He attended the five-hour Christmas Eve service at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. He wrote later how deeply moved he was. He said, I remember standing in the old church in Bethlehem close to the spot where Jesus was born when the whole church was ringing hour after hour with splendid hymns of praise to God. How again and again it seemed as if I could hear voices I knew well telling each other of the wonderful night of the Savior's birth. Three years later, as he was preparing for the Christmas season in 1868, he wanted to compose an original Christmas hymn for the children to sing in their annual program. And as he recalled the magical night in Bethlehem, he wrote a little hymn of five stanzas. And he handed the words to his organist, Louis Redner, saying, Louis, why not write a new tune for my poem? And if it's a good tune, I'll name it after you. I'll name it St. Louis, which he did. His organist, Louis Redner, struggled with his assignment. He complained that there was no inspiration. But finally, on the night before the Christmas program, Redner awoke with the music ringing in his soul, as he put it. The simple music was written in great haste and under great pressure, almost on the eve of Christmas. It was after midnight that a little angel, he said, whispered the strain in my ears, and I roused myself and jotted it down just as you have it. And then he went back to sleep. The next day, the very next day, a group of six Sunday school teachers and 36 children sang, O little town of Bethlehem, 
how still we see thee lie above thy deep and dreamless sleep the silent stars go by yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight I think it must be because we are so familiar with the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem that we rarely pause to consider why that was why Bethlehem why was the Messiah, the Savior of the world, born there? Now, I know someone could say, you know, Joseph had to travel. Luke tells us Joseph had to travel to his home area to pay taxes. They were doing an enrollment of taxes, and he had to go. And so there was a very practical reason Jesus had to be born in Bethlehem because Joseph and Mary went there to pay taxes, and that's true. Somebody else might say, well, preacher, uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem because the prophets foretold that the Messiah would come from the birthplace of the most beloved king Israel ever had, King David. As you went into, Jeru as you went into Bethlehem, outside the town, there was one of those signs that you see, of course. Bethlehem, birthplace of King David. They were so proud, and someone could rightly say that the Messiah was born there because King David was born in Bethlehem, and that would be true. But beyond the practical, beyond the prophetic fulfillment of Scripture, beyond those reasons, why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Why Bethlehem? The prophet Micah struggles with this. He's puzzled by the fact that anything magnificent would come from Bethlehem. That's why he says in his prophecy, you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah. In other words, though you are a little insignificant, podunk, backwater, nothing of a town, out of you, out of you will come the one to rule Israel. It's, a, it's astounding. Scholars believe that Nazareth, where Joseph and Mary traveled from and where they would return, Nazareth, it's estimated, maybe had a hundred people, maybe a few more, and Bethlehem was not much larger. I think I asked you on one other occasion, once upon a time, who's from the smallest town? Who thinks you're from the smallest town? Where are you from? Anyone? Gamaliel. Gamaliel. <laughs> what is the population of Gamaliel, Holly? The sign says 400. Is that stretching it? Is that dogs and cats? and Anybody beat Gamaliel for the smallest? Yeah, Jim? Garland. 50? <laughs> well, you need to get back there, man. They're uh, 50. Friends, we just take it for granted, but Micah, what he's really trying to say to us, it makes absolutely no sense that the Savior of the world would come from Garland, Kentucky, or Gamaliel, or Bethlehem. I mean, Rome, yes, we could understand that the, the most king of kings, the mighty one, Rome, sure, Alexandria, Absolutely. Jerusalem? Sure. Why not Jerusalem? But Bethlehem? It makes no sense. And yet, we don't even question the fact that we don't sing, do we? We don't sing, oh, magnificent town of Bethlehem, oh, splendid town of Bethlehem, oh, marvelous town of Bethlehem, oh, impressive town. Of Bethlehem. No, Phillips Brooks, when he went there in 1895, he got it exactly right. It was a little insignificant place. And so he was spot on when he wrote, Oh, 
little town of Bethlehem, little, tiny, insignificant Bethlehem. So friends, why? Why did God choose Bethlehem? And what does it tell us about God that God would choose Bethlehem? This is the audience participation part of the sermon. Any ideas? Why Bethlehem? Yes. Rachel buried there? Jacob's well here there? That may be. You just stumped the preacher. I'm moving to somebody else. <laughs> probably so. You're probably right. Yeah. Any other? Why Bethlehem? A place that seems insignificant. Is God insignificant? Why does God choose insignificance? Why? We had somebody at the, Randa, sitting right where you are at the early service, and he said, you know, that's the way God has always chosen. And if you were listening, and I know you were, to Gary's prayer, Gary prayed about how a little Bethlehem and a, 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 a tiny manger and a little baby, it's the way that God has always chosen. Would it be safe to say that God chooses different than we choose? Can I get an amen for that? I mean, would that, would that be accurate in our understanding of the Old and New Testament? God chooses. How many of you can remember, I don't know, I grew up playing football and basketball and baseball in the backyard of our neighborhood. How many of you grew up playing sports in the backyard? And do you, do you remember how you chose teams? I mean, you had to have two captains, right? And what was your worst nightmare as you stood in that crowd of potential team members? I mean, anybody know what I'm talking about? Dear Lord, don't let me be. And, and the selection began, right? Or I choose James Henry. Well, we got Brian. And they went down and down. And then, you know, your worst nightmare was there's a, there's a kid over there. He's on crutches. Who, what's your name? Tommy. Tommy what happened? I, well, I broke my ankle. Well, uh, are you okay? Uh, I tell you what. We'll take Tommy. You can have Jay. <laughs> right? I mean, that's the way we choose, right? And what's astounding is that's not the way God chooses. God chooses Tommy on the crutches first. Would it be safe to say that the grace of God never sees anything that's little or insignificant? Would it be safe to say that God chooses in a way that our world doesn't understand, that God uses the smartest or the strongest or the wealthiest, God chooses, you know who God chooses? God chooses people who need God. God, the only person that God can never use is a person who has no use for God. Because God doesn't force any of us to follow or to be part of God's solution in the world. Paul understood that in the scripture that Helen read. I love this passage. Paul is saying, look, if, when you became part of the church, when you came into the, the, the fellowship of the church, not many of you were wise by human standards. You weren't influential. You weren't well born. But God chose the foolish. God chose the weak. God chose those of lowly things. 
And why? Why did God do that? Why does God choose differently than we do? Paul said, because no one, no man, no woman has a right to ever boast. Unless Paul closes out his instruction, if you are going to boast, then you boast in the Lord. Let that be your boast. I didn't get to catch a, a lot of the coverage. I actually watched most of it on YouTube in the evening or tried to find ways that I could capture some of the funeral services for former President uh, George H.W. Bush. How many of you saw some of that this week or listened to some of that? I mean, do you remember what they talked about that his parents never allowed him to use two words? you remember what those were? I said, don't, you don't use I and you don't use me. How in the world do you get elected president? That's sort of the idea, right? The attention that you would get. The lifting up of yourself. And they instilled in him that you serve other people and it's about service. It was amazing. And in one of the, I don't know whose eulogy it was in, I may have read it in one of the articles as I was looking at things this week. But there was a, a prayer that uh, President Bush used in his inaugural address. He prayed this himself as part of his comments in 1989. Listen to this prayer. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and thank you for your love. Accept our thanks for the peace that yields this day and the shared faith that makes its continuance likely. Make us strong to do your work, willing to heed and hear your will. And write on our hearts these words. This, this, is, this is it. Write on our hearts these words. Use power to help people. For we are given power not to advance our own purposes, nor to make a great show in the world, nor a name. There is but one just use of power, and it is to serve people. Help us remember, Lord. Amen. Friends, God chooses differently. God has a different use for power in this world. And when we sing, O little town of Bethlehem, Lee's going to come and lead us in that beautiful that carol. And I would just ask you this. As you sing it this morning, would you do this? Would you offer yourself anew to Christ? Would you invite the Christ child to be born anew in your life again so that you can be part of that? Whatever power or influence God has given you, and there's much power and influence in this sanctuary, whatever it is, would you commit yourself to do it in ways that help other people and lift other people? That's the only reason God gives any of us any power or influence. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you're from. Gamalia? Garland? Or over here, somebody was from Speed, Indiana, population 100. Or from Bethlehem. God can use all of us, and God desires to. Would you stand as you're able? Lee's going to come and lead us. Let's sing this marvelous Christmas carol and recommit ourselves to Christ.
in Brooks's original uh, writing of this carol, the original fourth stanza is actually printed at the bottom of the insert. This was a stanza that was particularly written for the children of his parish, and the focus was on how those that are small and little turn and Christ and can make a difference in the world. And so let this be our sending forth. If you'll join with me, we're going to sing the uh, forgotten stanza of O Little Town of Bethlehem. Would you join with me? Peace.